As much as I enjoy farming, I have to admit that it is inherently often very risky business. That there's all sorts of injuries that one can sustain, whether they intend to or not. That there's all sorts of things that can happen. And whether it was cuts or scrapes or bruises or any number of different things, whatever happened to me, there was always one person that I returned to whenever I was at home, whenever I needed that thing fixed. And it was often my mom. Because she was the one that knew where the band-aids were, that she knew where the neosporin was, and she often knew what to do whenever I wasn't quite sure what to do with a particular injury, that she always had a good answer, that whatever it was, she could always make it better. And if we think about it, there are a lot of things in our days and a- day and age that we might want or desire that it be made better. Not just particular or personal injury, but oftentimes we look at society, we look at culture, we look at a church, we even look at our entire world, and we just wonder, is there anyone who can make it better? Is there anyone who can bring about the healing that is so longed for and so desired in our own heart? To begin to answer that question, we should start off with the reading from Isaiah, which was our first reading this morning. That he starts off speaking to the people and encourages them that they should, that those who heart, whose hearts are frightened be not afraid, that they should fear not. And why is this? If we understand the context of the book of Isaiah, we understand that he's prophesying to a people that are in exile, a people that are hurting, a people that are very much afraid. And so the Lord starts off, be not afraid. And then he continues on because he wants to make it very clear why one should not be afraid. That the Lord is at hand, that the Lord is bringing vindication, the Lord is coming to save his people, and that he is bringing them to safety. And as he's doing this, he knows, and Isaiah also, as he's speaking, he understands the people need to be made more aware. They might be tempted to misunderstand, or they might think that this is too nebulous or too general. So he starts to make it very specific. The Lord, when he comes, the blind will be able to see, the deaf will be able to hear, the mute will be able to speak, the lame will leap like a stag. All sorts of very vivid imagery. And this is something that would be miraculous to behold. But the Lord wants to make it even more personal. Because he wants to tell them about how the ways, even the desert, it will spring up. That all the dry lands, it will have water. That there will be so many signs and wonders that everything that seems to have gone wrong will be healed, made plain, and will indeed go to the opposite. That that even the desert that is dry will be made plenteous with water again. So there's this element of healing. The Lord is promising that as he comes to bring forth justice to his people, as he comes to bring them from exile, all sorts of miraculous things will happen, that healing will indeed be number one. And that is why the responsorial psalm is here. Praise the Lord, my soul. Not because necessarily everything has already been healed, but because the Lord is bringing about an immense amount of healing as he comes to save his people. We move on to the letter from St. James, and we are reminded very vividly of the human condition, but in particular, he wants to warn against a temptation that is there because of our human condition, that he tells his audience and his reader, show no partiality, that he doesn't want them to choose one person over the other. In particular, he's aware of the temptation of choosing rich over poor, or the haves over the have-nots. And he goes in and he wants to explain very clearly that one should not show partiality towards the rich because he's seen it done before. That oftentimes the rich will be set in a place of prestige while the poor will be set on the ground or somewhere to the side so that they're not really entertained all that much. And why is this occurring? Why does the human heart do do this very thing? Well, the human heart desires that whatever that rich person or the person with prestige or the person with rapport, whatever that person can do for them, they want that thing. And so they're going to treat that rich person well because of what they can gain later, not because they're necessarily interested in the good of that person, if they're being truly honest. But as St. James, he goes in and he parses this out. He reminds them very clearly that the Lord did not choose the rich. He did not want those who were in the haves. He often chose the have-nots to make a difference and even to inherit the kingdom of God. So he warns them very clearly, don't be associated with the rich. Rather, be associated with the poor so that you can receive the poor man's inheritance, which is the kingdom of God.
And then finally we move on to the gospel according to Mark, and we're told that Jesus, he's moving around, and the crowds, they know that where he is, and they bring to him in this particular man, a man who is deaf, a man who is struggling with a speech impediment, and because of that, he can't speak all that well. And so they ask Jesus, just simply lay your hands on him. Jesus takes him over to the side because he doesn't want this to just be a spectacle or a magic trick, but he wants this to be a personal encounter with this particular man, the one who is suffering and indeed needs to be healed. And so he put, places his fingers in the things that need to be healed, in his ears, on his tongue, and then he looks up towards heaven and groans, and then he says this beautiful prayer, Ephetha, be opened. This prayer still comes down to us through the church today in the liturgy of baptism, but it's a beautiful prayer as Jesus prays it. Ephetha, be opened. And we're told that immediately upon that prayer, this man, his ears were opened. He was able to speak very plainly that everything that had been going wrong before all of a sudden was enabled to go correctly. There was healing, there was a miracle, and it was marvelous to behold. And the Lord didn't want this to be made known, but the people were just in such shock, in such awe, that they couldn't help but make it known. That They said about Jesus, he's done all things well. Even the deaf are able to hear, the mute are able to speak. They've not seen anything like this before. And wouldn't it be miraculous to behold this? I don't know about you, but oftentimes when I read these gospel accounts, and this one in particular, wouldn't it be great to have been able to behold this man that we had all known, that was mute, that was deaf, that was unable to hear and speak, that he encounters healing, and all of a sudden his life is changed just by Jesus' own gesture and by his simple prayer of Ephetha, be opened. Wouldn't it be great to have been there, to have seen that very thing, to experience the healing that that man experienced that day? And while we might think ourselves far, far removed, even 2,000 years removed from such an experience, we need to understand why this is in the gospel today. Yes, it's showing us who Jesus was. Yes, it's showing us his divine power. But there's something more fundamental that he comes to bring us healing as well. Maybe not necessarily in the exact same way, but he comes to bring his people healing. But what does that mean for us right here and right now? Well, we need to ask ourselves a series of questions to understand why we would even dare to ask Jesus for healing or why we should ask Jesus for healing in the first place. The first question is, where do we need healing? And this might be a question that's hard to answer for many different reasons. In particular, we live in a day and an age that does not like to admit weakness. That if we have a wound or if we have an injury, we like to hide it and keep it to ourselves. We dare not show a doctor. We don't want anyone to know about our vulnerability or our weakness or where we seem to fall short of the mark. So that's often the case. But my brothers and sisters, each and every one of us, are ha we have an injury that we're struggling with, an area of weakness, a wound, something that our Lord can touch and heal. But the thing is, where is it? Perhaps it's like the first reading. Perhaps it's fear and anxiety. That it becomes so easy to be wrapped around the axle, wondering about the future, about what's going on, wondering how our world's going to experience some sort of healing. And we might even start to worry about our job, about our family, about relationships, about so many countless things that our hearts can have anxiety about. Perhaps that's where we are, that we find ourselves worrying about something or wrapped in fear and anxiety around a particular issue or a particular thing. Maybe it's loneliness. Maybe we struggle with feeling that we are truly cared for or truly loved, even though we're surrounded by dozens and dozens of people, that it's still very easy for us to feel alone or even misunderstood because we feel like if people knew the real person underneath, they wouldn't dare associate with me. Maybe it's that loneliness or that element. Or maybe we could even look at the gospel and we can understand that we may not be struggling with a physical deafness or a physical speech impediment, 
But maybe we're still struggling with these things nonetheless. Maybe we're struggling with what our ears hear. Maybe there's all sorts of negativity that our ears are hearing. Or maybe we're listening to all the wrong voices. We're listening to the siren songs of the world. And so we become so inundated with the noise that we just can't hear our Lord's voice. And we might even start to think to ourselves, the Lord isn't speaking. And so we become disheartened. We become frustrated because we can't hear the voice of the Lord any longer. But maybe it's not the Lord. Maybe it's us. Maybe our ears need healing. Maybe we need the, someone that can continue to remove all the noise from our ears so that we can truly hear. Or maybe it's our tongue. Maybe our tongue struggles with the affliction of gossip. Maybe it's filled with all sorts of drama. Maybe it just likes to perpetuate lies even unintentionally or accidentally that those are the things that we go after. Maybe it's cursing or foul language. Maybe there's a lot of different things that our tongue struggles with, that it speaks very well, but it speaks all the wrong things. Maybe that's where our Lord needs to bring us some healing. Because the reality is, my brothers and sisters, the more we sit with it, the more we pray with it, the more we think about it, likely we're going to discover many, many different places where each and every one of us need our particular healing. That we've got woundedness, we've got brokenness, and there's nothing in this world that can fix it. But that's the next question. Where are we trying to get it fixed? Now, to be very clear, there's all sorts of ways. There are all sorts of physicians, so to speak, that are trying to get our attention. Yes, there are many authors that have written self-help books. There are many different people that try to fill our lives with distractions. All sorts of entertainment, all sorts of athletes, all sorts of people in our lives that they try to boast that they have the answer. But the reality is, the wound persists. Or what's worse, the wound that is undetended often gets much worse. So who are we having, it, having fix it? Who are the ones that we're asking? Maybe it's the noise and distraction in our life. Maybe it is sports. Maybe it's social occasions. Maybe it's partying. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's all sorts of different things that really they profess to try to drown out whatever it is to make us ignorant of it for just a little while. But the reality is we know in our heart of hearts that place still exists. That place is still there no matter how much we try to bury it. But who are we trying to have, it fi have fix it? Or how are we trying to cover it over? But what if we didn't try to cover it over? What if we didn't try to ignore it? What if we didn't go to the wrong doctor or the wrong physician, the wrong nurse, trying to seek healing, the ones that cannot truly help us at the end of the day? What if we truly turn to the divine physician? What if we turn to our Lord and our God? What if we let Jesus have that area of woundedness, that area of brokenness, the injury, the hurt, the affliction, the suffering, the grudges, all of the things that hold us back in this life, that enslave us and encumber us so that it seems like we are about to break? What if we let the Lord have those places? What if we invite the divine physician in? What if we approach Jesus in the same way that that man was brought to Jesus that day? What if we approach him with those things? What if we go to his office, or indeed his church? Because my brothers and sisters, we can often start to become very hopeless or even despair about our own brokenness or the, the loads that we carry, the burdens that are so heavy that they seem to even start to threaten, to crush us. What if we take those things to the Lord? And that, in fact, is where the church enters in. Because as it's been called the field hospital for so many reasons, one of the first and foremost is that we have the divine physician right here in our midst. And he gives us these particular ways to heal us, especially in his grace and in his sacraments. There are two particular sacraments of healing that are often presented to us because the church is so concerned with our healing, with our well-being, with our integrity as a person that is restored by the light of Christ. That these two sacraments, being the anointing of the sick and reconciliation, they are here to remove from us all the wounds, all the afflictions, all the weight that burdens us and weighs us down that it is here to help us with those places. But my brothers and sisters, 
There's all sorts of reasons and excuses that we make for ourselves not to experience healing, not to experience the grace and the joy of the sacrament of reconciliation. Maybe we think the burden is too much. Maybe we think the Lord can't forgive this particular thing or that particular thing. Even though we know the church teaches very well that there is nothing that is unforgivable as long as we let the Lord in and we let him forgive that place. Or maybe we feel that we're just too frightened by the experience. That maybe we had a bad experience with reconciliation in the past, and so we dare not approach the doctor's office yet again in the sacrament of reconciliation. Maybe we don't think it's all that substantial. Maybe we don't think we really need it. Maybe we think that we're the exception to the rule. My brothers and sisters, why would we excuse ourselves from such a beautiful grace? Why would we excuse ourselves from the physician? Why would we make excuses to hold on to these burdens, all the afflictions, all the wounds, all the brokenness that we hold within? Why would we make an excuse to hold on to those things and hold ourselves captive for even longer? Because, my brothers and sisters, we have the answer. We have the sacrament of reconciliation. We have the divine physician that wants to speak to us and enter into our reality, our brokenness, and the areas where we are hurt that he wants to be there, but he wants to heal those things so that we can live in the freedom as sons and daughters of God. He doesn't want us to hold on to these things. He wants us to let them go. And yes, sometimes it is embarrassing to approach the doctor. Yes, sometimes it's embarrassing to say, I've got this cut or this bruise or this area or this wound that I just don't want exposed. But as we've often said, the wound that is not exposed is the one that festers and grows and does not get any better. What if we take these things to our Lord and our God? What if we approach the sacrament of reconciliation or the sacrament of the Eucharist? And what if we ask the Lord for the healing that we need, even if we've delayed it for years and years? What if we finally approach the Lord and talk to him about this place? What if we finally dared to ask him for healing? Because the Lord does want to make our life better. He does want to make our soul better. He wants to make every part of us made whole again. But we have to be vulnerable, and we have to ask for that healing in the first place. The Lord's not going to force us to heal, but he'd certainly like it if we'd ask for it. Because my brothers and sisters, each of us have wounds. And not just physical ones that my mother could heal or slap a Band-Aid on. Many of us are struggling inside. We're struggling with something on our heart and our soul. And we have places where we need healing and we need the Lord's grace and mercy. But we know the divine physician, he is willing to reach out and to speak to us, to be open again. That he wants to touch our, our ears. He wants to touch our tongue. He wants to touch our heart and our soul so that we truly may be made free. We can experience joy and we can experience that inheritance that we so long for. My brothers and sisters, the Lord wants us to be made better again. Where are those areas where you and I are struggling? Are we willing to approach our Lord and our God with these things? Because He is the divine physician and wants to bring us healing.